Well, let's continue in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. But this morning we're in chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, uh, it'll be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, turn in there to Matthew 7, verses 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And while you're turning there, let me share with you, uh, this past week, you know, on Sunday night we had the the picnic uh, at the park. Like I said, we we served uh, over 500 uh, people, and there were others that didn't eat. And and this morning in the first service, I said, find somebody that attended the picnic on Sunday. I had a hard time finding somebody that <laughs> in the first service that was attending that attended the picnic. But what's interesting on Monday, which you had a chance to have a day off and remember those who have served in our military and uh, helped bring the freedom that we have in this country, and Memorial Day, and I was down with our our son in the Santa Clarita area. And I was working in the house with him. And so at one point we ran over to one of the uh, hardware stores to pick up something and, and to work on the house. I'm in the hardware store, the, the, the box store that it was Lowe's or Home Depot, it was Lowe's. But, and, and we're walking and I, and, and I grab one of the clerks and I said, hey, um, where, where do I find it? I'm just amazed at those kind of people. No matter when you go to the Home Depot or Lowe's or those kind of places, you say, where is this? And they said, well, it's aisle six. And, right down, and they've got it right down to the T. You know, no matter, I, I tried to trick them at times. Eh? You can't do it. You know, they, so now I'm there with this guy. He's about 35 years of age. And <clears throat> so I said, you know, where do you find this? And, he, and we started to walk back together. Cause he's gonna sh- he's gonna, he told me he's going to show me what, what I needed. And... And on the way back, this is Santa Clarita now, on the way back, he says to me, you look familiar. He says, where do you go to church? (laughs) Now, how often does that get asked me? You know, I mean, usually I'm saying to somebody else, where do you go to church? I said, I said, I go to Faith Community Church in Palmdale. He said, I thought so. He said, I went there yesterday for the first time. He said, my girlfriend wanted me to go. And so we were there. He said, I was afraid to ask you. I was afraid to say, aren't you that pastor from there? So I said, that's, he said, that's why I asked, where do you go to church? And he said, I didn't want to be totally out to lunch. So I, we got sharing and, you know, with the Lord. He says, you know, it's the first time I was ever in a Protestant church. And he said, and so it was just, a, just an opportunity. He said, would it be okay? And Doug was there. He said, can he take a picture of us, and I'm going to send it to my girlfriend and say, look who I bumped into today. <laughs> so it's just uh, an important thing that we be living and praying and realize that you're going to bump into people. that well, You might not know them, but they know, oh, they, they say they're a Christian. Are they acting like it? And that's kind of what's going on in this passage where he's teaching us how to live in the world in front of others. So for a moment, let's turn to the text. Let me put it on the screen here. Keep asking, keep asking, and what? It will be given you. This is a really familiar passage of scripture, so don't let it run right off your back. You've heard this kind of text before, but there's something that he's wanting to say to us today. So he says, keep asking, and it will be given you. Keep searching, and what? You'll find. And then keep knocking, and the door will be open to you. He goes on in verse 8. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who searches finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. For what man among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, can I just pause there for a second? In case you didn't really understand the total depravity of man, that meaning that the Apostle Paul put it this way, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells what? No good thing. Now, that's not to say that you can't do good things. There are people that aren't saved, and they're they're able to do good things. Jesus even said that in this text. But just so you don't miss it, there is the total depravity of man. That means that sin affects what you look at, what you listen to, 
where your feet go, what your hands do, what your mind thinks. There's no area that sin has not penetrated your life and mine. And so how does Jesus word it? Look at the screen. If you then, who are what kind of people? Evil. So you might as well just admit it right from the start. Come running to the Lord and not with all your goodness, but with, Lord, I, this is where I am. You know I was born in sin. I live a life of sin. My parents didn't take me aside and say, let me teach you how to lie. So where'd you learn? It was part of your nature. They didn't take you aside and say, let me teach you how to cheat. So how did you even learn how to do that? How did somebody once, somebody had started someplace, where did it come from? Sin. Now the enemy gets after us. So what's he say? If you then, who are evil, because of the total depravity of man, know how to give good gifts. Is he saying that that evil in your life makes you unable to do anything good? No, you know how to do good things. But he said, here's the contrast. If you're evil and you know how to give good, then what does God, who is good, know what to do? If you know how to give good gifts, how much more? This argument is how much more? How much more? It's not, he, he's going to give more because he's not evil. He's good. And if you're evil and you can give good, just think what a good God can do. How much more does he want to give you? So he says here, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Let me put, let me put on the screen verses 1 through 12. This is the, the paragraph that he's teaching. I'll let you see the whole thing. I know it's small. I just want you to kind of see it. And last week we were looking at verses 1 through 6. That's one portion of this paragraph. And we said, here's his focus last week. He said to them, do not judge and don't give what is holy to the dogs. Now, really what that means in in that sense, they would sacrifice animals, you know, an ox, a lamb, and they would offer it to the Lord. And you remember that the priest and the Levites would get their earnings from that. They'd get their food from that. And he said, that was offered to the Lord. And he said, do you go and offer that then to the dogs? He said, don't give what is holy to dogs. So in this first section, verses 1 through 6, what do we say? This is what not to do. Don't judge. Don't give holy things to unholy beings in that sense. So let me slide this down and look at the second portion of this text. He says, Keep asking and it will be giving you. Keep searching and you'll find. Keep knocking, the door will be open. Because now he's going to tell you what I want you to keep doing. First, don't do this. Secondly, do this and this and this. Keep doing this and this and this. Now for a moment, let me take these three. Keep asking, keep searching, keep knocking and slide it over here for a moment. These are three verbs. And a verb always indicates action. Something you're doing. She ran. He jumped. This, in this case, he says, ask, asking, searching, knocking. Now, what I want you to get is these are commands. And throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is giving commands to people. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. Don't do this. It's a command. Don't do this. In this chapter, he's giving three more commands. Let me teach you about these commands because these three commands are all second person plural. They're active voice, they're present tense, and they're imperatives. But what does that mean to most of us? This is English class. No, it's not, you know. And most of you say, oh, English, I don't like English anyway. So let me just slide this over for a second so that you understand the New Testament written in Greek is very specific so that we exactly, we know exactly what he wants when he uses this kind of a word. So when we say it's an imperative, that means it's a command. 
So he's going to just command it. This is what I want you to do. And by the way, the keep asking, keep searching, keep knocking are all just one word in Greek each. Okay? They're imperatives. But what you need to understand in Greek is there are two kinds of imperatives. One is an eris called imperative, and that means that it happens one time, and that's it. It's happening. There it is. The other imperative is a present tense imperative. And what do we say? Look on the left-hand side. It's in the imperative, and it's present tense. If it's present tense imperative, look at the screen. It means it's continuous. So I want you to do this, and I want you to keep doing this, and I want you to keep doing it, and keep doing it, and keep doing it. It's going to be continuous tense. So it's active voice. We participate in it. It's not something that gets done to us. It's something we do. You keep asking. You do this, and do this, and do this. Not this is going to be done to you, and you sit there while somebody else asks. The last thing, it's second person plural, which means that everyone. It's not just George or just Bob. It's not just one person. It's not singular. It's plural. Everybody does this. Now let me take you to verse 7 again, and look. I want to give you several translations, and look how it gets translated here. The top translation is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It's the one we use in our morning services. It's not the only Bible we use in our church, but it is a, a Bible that we say, okay, so everybody's on the same page when it's on the screen. If you want to know, this is what we're using. Christian Standard Bible put out by Holman. You've heard of the Holman Study Bible and different things like that. Holman's Dictionary. The second translation is the English Standard Version, then the King James Version, then the New American Standard Version, and then the old NIV, 1984. <laughs> the old NIV. And then the, you have a, a new... The NIV is the New International Version. Now you have the old New International Version, 1984. And then you have the one that was just recently done. Look at the screen, and what do you see? There's virtually the major difference is what I've highlighted on the top. And what is that? Keep asking, because what's the Greek tense that's used there? Present continuous imperative. So it's, I want you to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. So the nuance, and one of the reasons we use the Christian Standard Bible is because they'll take the nuances of the Greek and give you the specific interpretation. Are the others good? Yes, we'll use the others as well, and many of you have them. It's just explaining to you, look at the nuance that he's giving there. What does he want us to do? Keep asking. Present tense, continuous. John MacArthur says it this way. Ask is very simple. A child does that. There's no involvement in it. There's no participation in it. You, you just ask. Seek is stronger than asking. There's a participation in it. Knock. You're banging away. You're knocking at the door. There's a greater participation. So here's the sermon for today. If somebody said, what did Pastor Madison speak to you about today? Here it is. Obeying the Lord's commands allows us to enjoy his promises. How many commands did he give us on the text? Keep what? Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. So he's got how many commands? Three commands. Now what he does is he's given us those commands and we're not obedient to them. If we don't keep asking, if we don't keep seeking, if we don't keep knocking and we're not obedient, how can we expect the promises? He ties three promises to these three commands. Did you catch that? Let me, say, let me put it on the screen this way. Jesus ties three promises to the commands he's just given us about asking and seeking and knocking. But if you're not obedient to the command, then you don't have the privilege of the promises. You have the privilege of driving down the street you know, on the highway and driving around and going back and forth to the grocery store and whatever you need to go in your car. If you abuse and don't obey the law and the commands, what happens to your privileges? You know, you get slapped on the hand or you get, they get taken away. And your license gets what? 
suspended or revoked or taken from you. God says, I, I have some promises for you, but they're hooked to the commands. And the commands are keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this. Now the problem is, you've heard, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. And yet you don't do it. Is there something we don't understand about ask? Is there something we don't understand about seek? Knock. We understand it all. Why don't we do it then? But he says, keep doing this and keep doing this. Let me give you the promises that are tied here. First one, ask and what? It'll be given to you. It'll be given to you. Here's what the text says. Keep asking and it will be given to you. Now he's talking about praying, isn't he? I ask for the Lord. I ask in prayer, Lord, would you give me this? Lord, would you do that? Lord, would you reach this person? Lord, would you protect these people? Lord, would you provide for this missionary? Lord, would you? We're asking. In what? Prayer. We're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And this is not the first time he's talked to us about prayer and the Sermon on the Mount. This is chapter 7. What do you teach us in chapter 6? When you pray... Say this, our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What, what do we call that prayer? Traditionally, the Lord's Prayer. So he's already taught us. Prayer must be really important to the, the Lord. In three chapters, two chapters, he's given over to, I want you to pray. I want you to ask. Let me show you in, in Matthew 6. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Which means what? So, so be it. Let me illustrate to you. Uh, when it comes to asking God for some things, um, let me tell you this story. The gal's name is Ruby. And Ruby trusted the Lord when she was in her 20s. At the time she wrote and told about this, she was in her 50s. While she was in her 20s and she trusted the Lord, she got married. And her husband, high-powered CEO kind of guy, wasn't a believer. And so for 30 years, she prayed that the Lord would save him and reach him. You think that's pretty good, pretty persistent. Lord, reach him, save him. After 30 years, she said, one day she was praying, and just a peace came over her. A peace that she felt like, okay, God's going to do something, and he's, he's going to be okay. He's going to get saved. Then, two days later, he's in a car crash, and he's killed. And she thought, Lord, you gave me that peace. And I, and I, why didn't you answer? He died and he, he never trusted you. How do you cope with unanswered prayer like that? You know what Ruby did? Ruby decided to walk away from the Lord. Let me tell you another story that would tie into that. Roger Simons was hitchhiking his way home after finishing his time in the military. Roger would never forget the date. Why? May 7th, the day he got out of the army. He was on his way home. He's hitchhiking. His suitcase was heavy and he was anxious to take off his army uniform once and for all. He threw out his thumb. I don't know about you. I've only hitchhiked a couple of times in my life. 
way, you know, when people were, were allowed to hitchhike, way back in 19, oh, it was 1969. It was the week that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And when he was assassinated, they closed the college down where I was in Chicago. They closed it down for the week, and I hitchhiked back to New York. My folks had a cow. <laughs> but this guy, he's out of the military now. He's going to hitchhike home. His suitcase was heavy. He was anxious to take off his army uniform once and for all. He flashed his thumb at, at an oncoming car, and it stopped. An elegantly dressed businessman asked the newly distar- discharged soldier, Are you going home for keeps? Yes, sir, Roger replied. Well, you're in luck if you're going to Chicago. I'm headed that way. My name is Hamilton, he said. On the trip, Roger was feeling compelled to share his Christian faith with the businessman. You ever been there where you felt like, I know I need to say something. And it's just, all of a sudden, you're prompted. I, I, how do, and you're waiting for the right words. Maybe they're going to say something that will say, well, you know, that reminds me of... And then you're, you're sharing the Lord with him. He said, when they were about 30 minutes from his drop-off, Roger finally blurted out, Mr. Hamilton, I'd like to talk to you about something very important. For the next several minutes, he told the driver the plan of salvation. And then asked him if he'd like to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Hamilton swerved over to the side of the road. Roger expected that he was going to be tossed out. Instead... Hamilton bowed his head and invited Christ into his life. When he dropped Roger off, he said, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. He gave Roger his business card and said, if you ever get to Chicago, look me up. Five years went by. Roger married and started a business of his own. As he was packing for a trip to Chicago he came across Hamilton's business card. In Chicago, he looked up Hamilton Enterprises. The reception told him that it was impossible to see Mr. Hamilton, but he could see Mrs. Hamilton. Roger was ushered into the beautiful office and found himself facing a woman who extended her hand and said, how did you know my husband? Roger told her about how Mr. Hamilton had picked him up hitchhiking home. Mr. Simonson, uh, she said, can you tell me what day that was? <laughs> yes, it, it was five years ago, uh, on May 7th, the day I was discharged from the army. She asked if he could tell her anything about their conversation that day. Roger has hesitated, not knowing if he should mention sharing the gospel with her husband. And Mrs. Hamilton I explained to your husband the way of salvation. He pulled over to the side of the road. He wept against the steering wheel and gave his heart to Christ. She started to sob. Roger asked Mrs. Hamilton, is everything all right? Please call me by my first name. It's, it's Ruby. She said, for 30 years, I prayed for my husband's salvation. For the last five years, I've given up hope. Where's your husband? Asked Roger. She slowly answered, he never made it home that night. He was killed just a few miles down the road from where he dropped you off on the night of May 7th. You were the last person he ever saw. And yes, God did answer Ruby's prayers after all. The difficulty is sometimes we pray and we don't see the answer. God doesn't let us see everything. One guy, he had several buddies and he prayed for several buddies and only one of them held out and held out and held out. Wouldn't come to know the Lord. The guy passed away. The guy came to his funeral. And at his funeral, he trusted Christ. He never saw the answer, but God answered. For some of you, you don't know. that You've been praying for somebody to get saved in your family. I don't know if God will say, 
right, right to you. It's happened. They got saved. Now you know they're going to heaven. You know, sometimes God says, the answer is yes. And sometimes God says, yes, and, and here's more. And sometimes he says, no. And sometimes he says, no. I love you too much to give you that. And sometimes he says, not, not now. And I don't know where you are in that process. But what's the command he's asking you to do? Ask, and it will be given you. But, you know, sometimes we're afraid to ask. I can't ask God for that. Why not? Well, if it's sin, we know you can't ask God for that. And if it's for selfishness, we know God says you have, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you could consume it on your own lusts. Lord, let me win the lottery. And the Lord says, no, I'm going to keep you from that one. I want to say somebody had written a book on the people, all the, the people that had won the lottery and most of their families have been destroyed and ruined by it. Why? Because they have so much money and everybody's saying, well, you got enough money. Why can't you give me that? I need a car, I need a house, I need a this, I need a that. And everybody starts asking for money. God says, no, I'm not going to give you those kind of things. I love you too much. But he asks us to come and to pray. Hebrews 4.16 says it this way. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with what? With boldness. Not brashness, but boldly saying, Lord, you know, you know they're lost. Lord, would you save them today? And he's not willing that what? And he should what? Perish. So if I'm praying, Lord, reach them. His heart is engaged in love. Do it boldly. Let me give you another example of this. This uh, happens to be uh, Helen R- Rosevere. Helen was a missionary, missionary nurse in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. As a nurse, her story goes like this in her own words that she said, one night I was working with a young gal in the labor room. The baby was to be born. But in spite of all we did, in her words, in spite of all we did to help her, she died. Leaving us with a tiny, premature baby and a crying two-year-old daughter. Since we had no incubator, we had no electricity or special feeding facilities, we would have difficulty keeping this baby alive. Although we lived on the equator, nights were often chilly with treacherous drafts. One student midwife went for the box we had for such babies to get the blanket that the baby would be wrapped in. Another went uh, and stoked up the fire to fill a hot water bottle. She came back shortly in distress to tell me that in filling the hot water bottle, it had burst. Rubber perishes easily in tropical climates. And it is our last hot water bottle, she exclaimed. All right, I said. Put the baby as near to the fire as you can safely place it. Sleep between the baby and the door to keep it free from the drafts. Your job is to keep the baby warm. The following noon, as I did most days, I went to have prayers with any of the orphan, orphanage children who chose to gather with me. I gave the youngsters various suggestions of the things to pray about and told them about the tiny baby. I explained our problem about keeping the baby warm enough, mentioning the hot water bottle. The baby could so easily die if it got chills. I also told them of the two-year-old sister crying because her mother had died. During the prayer time, one 10-year-old girl, her name was Ruth, prayed with the usual blunt, blunt conciseness of our African children. Her prayer went like this. Please, God, she prayed, send us 
a, a water bottle. It will be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead. So please send it this afternoon. While I gasp inwardly at the audacity of the prayer, the little 10-year-old added, and while you're at it, would you please send a doll for the little girl so she'll know you really love her? We as parents would go, oh, if this doesn't happen, will she be disappointed? How does this get handled? As often with children's prayers, I was put on the spot, she said. Could I honestly say, amen? I did not believe that God would do this. Oh, yes, I, I know that he can do everything. The Bible says so. But there are limits, aren't there? The only way God could answer this particular prayer would be by sending a parcel from the homeland, which in her case was England. I had been in Africa for almost four years at that time, and I had never, ever received a parcel from home. Anyway, if anyone did send a parcel, who would put in a hot water bottle? I live on the equator. Halfway through the afternoon, while I was teaching in the nurse's training school, a message was sent that there was a car at my front door. By the time I reached home, the car had gone. But there on the veranda was a large 22-pound parcel. I felt tears pricking my eyes. I could not open the parcel alone. So I sent for the orphanage children together we pulled off the string, carefully uh, undoing each knot. We folded the paper, taking care not to tear it unduly. Excitement was mounting. Some 30 or 40 pairs of eyes were focused on the large cardboard box. From the top, I lifted out brightly colored knitted jerseys. Eyes sparkled and the kids as I pulled them out. Then there were the knitted bandages for the leprosy patients, and at that the children looked a little bored. Then came a box of mixed raisins and food. Then as I put my hand in again, I felt the, could it really be? I grasped it and pulled it out. Yes, a brand new rubber hot water bottle. I cried. I had not asked God to send it. I had not truly believed that he could. Ruth was in the front row with all the children with a box. Ruth rushed forward crying, if God has sent the bottle, he must have sent the doll too. <laughs> Rummaging down to the bottom of the box, Ruth pulled out the small, beautiful, dressed doll. Her eyes shone. She had never doubted. Looking up at me, she asked, Can I go over with you, mummy? the British background that she has. Can I go over with you, mommy, and give this doll to that little girl so she'll know that Jesus really loves her? Rose said this, that parcel had been on the way for five whole months. Do you get that? Packed up by my former Sunday school class, whose leader had heard and obeyed God's prompting to send a hot water bottle even to, Equ even to the equator. And one of the girls had put in a doll for an African child five months before in answer to the believing prayer of a 10-year-old to bring it that afternoon. You know, if God wants to do those kind of things, and we could go on with hundreds and thousands of stories like that, 
What's he commanded us to do? To ask. Here's the illustration that Jesus uses in the text. In Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 9, 10, 11, here's what he says. What man among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? He said, you're evil. But when your son says, can I have some bread? And he'll say, well, here, have a stone. Or he goes on. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. He said, that, that doesn't happen. He goes on, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. And it's an a priori argument. If you are this way and you're evil and you know how to give good, how, what's the text say? How much more will God do for you? Because he's good. He's not evil. It's, it's the Romans 8 passage. If God is for us, who can be against us? Neither height nor depth. Nor, and he goes on and he scrapes the Milky Way and he scrapes the depths and he said, as wide as you can go and as deep as you can go and as high as you can go. If he didn't spare his own son, how much more is he willing to give you? If he gave you the most important thing in his son, do you think he's not willing to take care of your financial needs and your health needs and whatever needs you have? To those that do what? Ask. Verse 7 says ask. Verse 8 says ask. Verse 11 says to those who do what? Ask. It's always waiting on you to ask. Let me use this illustration by John Maxwell. Let me zero in on the map here. United States and then go into Minnesota. Because we can, we can use illustrations from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We can use illustrations from your life and my life. This one happened back in 1876. Here's Minnesota. Wisconsin is to the right there. Iowa below that. You can see the Great Lakes to the east of that. John Maxwell wrote in his book, Partners in Prayer, in the summer of 18, 1876, now, just so you can lodge in the time, in the summer of 1876, grasshoppers nearly destroyed the crops in Minnesota. So in the spring of 1877, farmers were worried. They believed that the dreadful plague would once again visit them and again destroy the rich wheat crop bringing ruin to thousands of people. The situation was so serious that Governor John Pillsbury, you ever heard of that name? Proclaimed, Governor John Pillsbury proclaimed April 26th as a day of prayer. Fasting and prayer. He urged every man, woman, and child to ask God to prevent the terrible scourge of all those pests. On that April day, all schools, shops, stores, and offices were closed. There was a reverent, quiet hush over the state. You know, if you go one year in 1876 without crops, and then the next year, the grasshoppers wiped them out again. But here's what happened. They prayed. The next day, April 27th, dawned bright and clear. Temperatures soared to what they ordinarily were in midsummer, which was very unusual for April. Minnesotans were devoted as they discovered, were devastated as they discovered billions of grasshopper larvae wiggling to life. They're thinking, we prayed, but God didn't answer. The weather's warm, all these grasshoppers are coming to life. He says, for three days, the unusual heat persisted and the larva hatched. It appeared that it wouldn't be long before they started feeding and destroying the wheat crop. And what do people think? They prayed and God didn't what? Didn't answer. On the fourth day, 
However, the temperature suddenly dropped. And that night, frost covered the entire state. It killed every one of those creeping, crawling pests as surely as if poison or fire had been used. It went down in the history of Minnesota as the day God answered the prayers of the people. Do you understand? They thought God didn't answer. And maybe you're sitting here thinking, God hasn't answered your prayers. I don't know what he's doing, but what he did in Minnesota was warm the place up so everything could come out, so he could kill them all. So their crops would, in answer to their prayers, last. I don't know what he's doing in your life, but maybe behind the scenes, he's keeping, he's saying to you, keep asking, keep asking. He may say it this way in 1 John chapter 3. Verse 21 and 22. Dear friends, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God and can receive whatever we ask. Why? We can receive whatever we ask from him. Why? Because we keep his, what? Commands. And what were the three commands? Keep doing what? Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking because we keep his commands. See, obeying the Lord's commands allows us to enjoy his promises. And here are the three promises. Ask and it will be given you. Second promise, seek and it will be found by you. I reworded that. And somebody's going to get upset with me because, wait a minute, that's not the way the text goes. Seek and you shall find. I just wanted to flow there together so you could see. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and it will be found by you. You're going to say, either way, I want you to remember it. Just keep seeking. Let me give you what the text says. It says it this way. Keep asking, and it will be given you. Keep searching, and you will find. Keep knocking, and the door will be open to you. Matthew 7, verse 8. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who searches does what? He finds. Let me give you the the Greek word that's used in this text. It's used in verse 7 and it's used in verse 8. A little bit different, but here's what's used in verse 7. is a tone. In uh, verse 8, rather. In verse 7, this is what's used. Zetetet. It is the same Greek word that he used earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. So if I say to you, keep asking, you know what it means to keep asking. You know how to ask people. But if I say, keep seeking, you say, well, what's hidden? You know, let's play hide and what? Hide and seek. So something must be hidden if I need to keep seeking. He says, keep seeking. And this is verse uh, 7 and 8. The same Greek is used in Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount again. Matthew 6, he talked about prayer. Matthew 7, he's talking about prayer. Matthew 6, he talks about seeking. Matthew 7, he talks about seeking. He says, keep seeking. What is it, Matthew 6, 33? You know that verse? It's the famous one that you probably know. It goes like this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things be it added unto you. Same Greek word. Keep seeking. Keep seeking. We know what it's like on a search and rescue. These are some pictures of some search and rescue. Uh, on the right-hand side, you know, when some guy's in the mountain and he gets in an avalanche or a collapse or he gets injured skiing. I don't know anybody who's ever had that happen. But, you know. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Yeah, when they took me off the hill with a broken collarbone, they said, you know, here, we'll, we'll rescue you. You know, and when they lift you out with a helicopter or when they send in the dogs... I mean, there's so many things. This is what it means to seek. Asking, you use your lips. <laughs> when you're seeking, you're out there doing more. You're out there seeking something. Let me give you this example. On Easter, on Resurrection Sunday, this year, March 31st, 
in Orange County, in the Cleveland National Forest, there were two people that were lost. They started out putting a search and rescue for them. The search went on for five complete days. It cost Orange County $160,000. They, they found them. Then they said, can we get the money out of them? <laughs> and if they're like most of us, you say, what money? And so they've they have ruled that they can't get the money. Searching is costly. And it may cost you something to seek, keep seeking. And what do we keep seeking? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So you put yourself in second, third, fourth, fifth position. And what do you do first? Seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God wants to do those wonderful things. He says, and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. But seek first his kingdom. Even the Old Testament, Isaiah 55, 6 says it this way. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. So whether it's Old Testament or New Testament or today, what does he command us to do? Keep seeking. And if you do, you're going to find it may be that you'll find the greatest things in life. Have you, ever heard the, have you ever heard the story of the man who searched so hard for the flower of happiness and found it in his own backyard? You know, that's what usually happens. We think, well, if I go over here, it'll be better. If I could live there, it'd be better. Oh, man, if I could do that. And if I had that house, and if I had that car, and if I had... And once he learned the secret of contentment, is seeking first the kingdom of God. But that's hard for the world to catch. Let's go back here. Obeying God's commands brings his promises. There are three promises. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and it will be found by you. Knock, and it will be what? Open. Now, he doesn't open every door. Thank God he doesn't open every door. Sometimes you, you or... I get in a position where we ask for things that God says, no, I love you too much. I don't want to give you that. But he says, keep doing what? Knocking. Keep knocking. Let me uh, put this scripture on the screen. Keep asking and it will be given you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. Let me give you another text. He goes on, for everyone that asks, receive, and the one who searches, finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through uh, 9. This is 5 through 7 on the screen now, but 5 through 9 has the story. Jesus told two stories about people knocking on the door. And on this one, Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 9, he ties in to keep knocking and the door will be opened unto you. So he, let's find out how he interprets this passage. Jesus also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. Then the guy on the inside will answer from the inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up and give you anything. The text goes on. Jesus said, I tell you, even though he won't get up and give his neighbor anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's what? His friend being just persistent. Keep doing what? Knocking. And the door will be open. He goes on, yet because of his friend's persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, and then he ties in today's text, the parallel passage. So I say to you, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. Now it's also in Luke 18 verses 1 through 8 or so where you have the woman who goes to the unjust judge and she keeps knocking and he answers. I would say to you, there were times, one time Audrey and I were looking, we were 
early in our marriage, we've been married uh, 38 years now. At that time, we were probably married two years. There were a couple of apart apartment complexes. They happened to be five apartments in one, five apartments in the other. They were all brick buildings, 15 years old, and they were for sale. $180,000, I think they were, for all 10 apartments. Audrey and I thought, maybe we ought to try to buy that, you know, because, you know, we could if, and take 30 years to pay for it, you know, we'll have, you know, we could have something and provide for us later on. She's a little worried about it. I said, well, let's knock, and if God closes the door, let's thank him for closing the door, you know? What is it? If, if we knock, and he says, no, no, I love you too much. I don't, you don't need that. You don't, I don't want you tied down on that. So uh, we, we, I, I went and talked to the banker, the bank president. The bank president had attended the church where I was a youth pastor. And so I went and talked to him, and he said, you know something? How much do you make? How much does your wife make? And he says, you know something? If, you're, if, that, if somebody decides not to pay the rent, he said, you need almost 100% occupancy to, to pay the bills on that place. And he said, you know, so you, you're going to be in a world of hurt if somebody doesn't pay the rent. Or what are you going to do if the refrigerators go bad? you got 10 apartments there, you know. And so he said, no, I, 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 I'd counsel you not to do it. It's fine with me, you know. Went back, my wife and I prayed, thanked the Lord. The next day in the newspaper, the next day, the people who were renters in those 10 apartment units were on the front page of the paper picketing the landlord because the building was like 15 years old and the refrigerators were going bad and the roof was leaking. And I go, oh, it's the big one. And I, I said, God, thank you for saying what? No. No. I felt like a deer that had been shot at and missed, and I had new hope. <laughs> I could see it. Youth pastor, slum landlord. <laughs> I said, oh, Lord, thank you. He said, no. And you need to thank God sometimes that he says no. Sometimes he just opens that door and lets you go through. And sometimes he says, an open and effectual door is there for me and I'm going to go through it. And sometimes you say, God, close the door if this is not what you want. And he's willing to do that. Here's what John Stott said. John passed away a couple of years ago, but on most things he really was kind of right on. He says this, do human parents wait before supplying their children's needs until their children ask for, for them. I need this, Mommy, can you get that? I need this, Daddy, can you get that? Do, do we as parents say, I'm not going to do anything for you until you ask? No, we, we give things to them. He goes on and says, to this we reply that the reason why God's giving depends on our asking is neither because he is ignorant until we inform him nor is it because he's reluctant until we persuade him. It's not like God says, oh, oh, I didn't know you needed that. He knows everything. He knows. And it's not like we're going to twist his arm and say, oh, okay, okay, I, uncle, I'll, I'll get it for you. He goes on, the second part of this quote, the reason has to do with us, not with the Lord. The question is not whether he is ready to give, but whether we are ready to receive. Because if we receive the wrong thing, if we're not ready to handle our responsibility, he wants to put us through some more training. If we're not ready to handle some money, he's wanting us to give time. The question today is, are you asking? Are you, you keep asking? Do you keep seeking? Do you keep knocking? Especially for the people that are in your neighborhood who are lost. The people in your family who are lost. Let's pray that God would use us for his glory. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and what it teaches us. And we pray that in our lives, you would teach us again today how to walk with you. While your heads are bowed, perhaps you would say, Pastor, would you just pray for me in closing? Uh, there's something that I'm praying about that I need to ask God to help. If I can be praying with you about this, would you slip up your hand? Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, you've seen our people reach out saying, pray for me. Lord, you're the one that can change what's going on in their lives right now. Whatever their need was, we lay it in these moments before you. Help them to turn to you and help them to be willing, whatever your answer is, to give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.